Good afternoon, or whatever time zone it is in your time zone. Welcome to Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds for August 3rd, 2022. My name is Antonio Neri from the Division of Scientific Education and Professional Development at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds is sponsored by the CDC Preventive Medicine Residency and Fellowship, as well as the Health, as well as the Health Resources and Services Administration, Bureau of Health Workforce. The PMRF provides 12 and 24 month full-time longitudinal service learning opportunities with senior public and population health leaders for physicians, veterinarians, and nurses who have completed CDC's epidemic intelligence service program or have equivalent public health experience. You can see we use Zoom for the audio and presentation in the question box to pose questions. You can click on the Q&A box in the bottom to pose your questions. Note that you can pose questions via the question box at any point during the lecture, and those speakers will work on answering them at their discretion. Your name may be appear associated with the question you posed. If you do not want your name to be associated with the question, then please check the Submit Anonymously box. Also during this session, we are going to offer an opportunity for a couple interactive sessions with our speaker. And so that's, uh, please pay attention. And if you have uh, uh, want to be involved in an interaction with our speaker, please submit something through the, the Q&A box when he prompts you to do so, and, and we will unmute your microphone. If you are one of those people, make sure you're not double muted. So if you have a mute on your, your device and a mute on your computer and a mute on Zoom, make sure those are all undone because we will unmute you on our, uh, on our webinar series. I also ask that you maintain the respect that we expect at CDC and have a question that, or a response that is pertinent to the topic and stay on that topic during the time period. Continuing education credits are available for the live course up to one month after the presentation date for the recorded version and up to two years after the date of the presentation for the recorded version through the CDC Training and Continuing Education online portal. The course code for this Grand Rounds and all of our Grand Rounds is all capital letters CDCPMRF. Again, the course code to access the test is CDCPMRF. If you have any questions, please contact the program at prevmed.cdc.gov. Please remember that the views presented by the speaker are not are theirs alone and do not necessarily represent the CDC, the Department of Health and Human Services, or the U.S. government. I'm especially pleased to have Dr. Harrelson, uh, Harold come and talk about our, our presentation today because uh, Dr. Cheston, I'm sorry. Uh, we often don't get great content about cost effectiveness in preventive medicine uh, education overall, and he has come highly recommended by Dr. Bob Kirkaldi, as well as a number of his peers to come and present to us. So I'm especially excited to have him come and talk. The title of his, his talk will be Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Cost Effectiveness, But We're Afraid of Being Bored. I think that that's incredibly uh, a bold title, and, uh, and I'm very excited to have Harold come talk. Before he starts, I want to take our usual moment of silence to pay our respects for the people that take their and their colleagues, friends, and families who've dedicated their time, energy, and sometimes lives fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, well, let's get started. The presentation will be approximately one hour with 30 minutes for questions and answers afterward. Please welcome our presenter. Hello. Uh, again, I'm Harold Chesson. I'm a health economist in the Division of STD Prevention at CDC, and it's my honor to be here today to talk to the Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds, and I appreciate the invitation. A long time ago, before I gave my first presentation at CDC, one of my mentors gave me a piece of advice. He said, remember, there's three kinds of people in the world, those who are good at math and those who aren't. So make sure your presentation appeals to all three types. So I wanted to make sure people aren't worried that, uh, about there being too much math in this presentation. Now it is uh, economics and cost effectiveness. So we will get into some math, but it'll be some basic addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division. So don't worry about the math. The other piece of advice that the mentor gave me was when you're explaining technical things, explain it like you would to your mom and dad. And I hope I succeed at that today because I think my parents are actually planning to log on for the presentation. So mom and dad, I hope you find that this presentation is, is reasonably clear.
As an economist at CDC, I get asked questions uh, like this quite often, especially questions like, why does CDC need economists? What do the health economists even do? What is a cost effectiveness ratio? What is discounting? What is a quality? What does dominated strategy mean? And what I want to do today is to go over uh, these basic questions and provide answers to them. So hopefully you can have a better understanding of what goes on in a cost effectiveness analysis and a better understanding of what health, econo uh, health economists do. Now it's been said that an economist is someone who is good at math, but who lacks the personality to be an accountant. And uh, I think this probably isn't isn't particularly fair. I think if you'll find that economists and accountants can be a lot of fun to hang out with, um, provided you enjoy them in moderation, of course. But the reason, uh, because of perceptions like this, that's why I wanted to give the the presentation a title that indicated that I would do my best uh, to at least not uh, be boring. Um, so, with that in mind. What I decided to do was to skip the usual outline of a CDC type presentation where we talk about background and methods and discussion and results and to go with an unconventional outline like the one you see here. So what I'll do first is I'll talk about the CDC's Prevention Effectiveness Fellowship, Monkeypox, and the Gettysburg Address. And from there, I'll explain how drunk drivers prove that CDC needs economists. And then I'll work my way down this list of topics. And in doing so, I'll, I'll be answering uh, that list of questions that I posed earlier. So let's kick it off now with the uh, PE Fellowship, Monkeypox, and the Gettysburg Address. So the CDC uh, Stephen M. Toysh Prevention Effectiveness Fellowship was created to ensure that there's well-trained health economists with expertise in policy analysis and related skills. And CDC has recruited and trained uh, health economists through this fellowship for more than 20 years. And it's the largest two-year postdoctoral training of its kind in the US. And last year in 2021, the PE Fellowship uh, began offering the public health analytics and modeling track as an option within the fellowship. So whereas the fellowship in the past typically brought in uh, economists and, and similar uh, types of disciplines, uh, it's now also uh, open, opening up to include uh, modelers. And the goal for this is to uh, grow CDC's capabilities around advanced analytics and infectious disease modeling. And I think this is uh, particularly important now. And the, the monkeypox outbreak um, illustrates the need for this new track that we have in the fellowship for this infectious disease modeling. And already even uh, the fellows have been contributing to CDC's monkeypox response. And the fellowship has worked exactly as it was designed to do. For example, we have two fellows in, in STD, sexually transmitted disease prevention, and they've been learning about uh, sexually transmitted disease infectious, uh, infectious STD models. And that training that they have received has made them uh, even better suited, I think, to respond to the monkeypox outbreak. There was a model in the, in the UK and, and, and those authors suggested that there's a small fraction of individuals that have disproportionately large numbers of sex partners, and that this can explain the sustained growth of monkeypox cases in the population of gay, bisexual, and other uh, men who have sex with men, MSM. And in fact, uh, it's long been known in the STD world that uh, different people have different numbers of sex partners. And if you and, and STD models need to account for these sexual networks and how people uh, mix with one another. This is an example of one of the studies that provides us data on how people uh, mix uh, with one another. This shows um, the the number of one-time sex partners that people have had in the past six months. And this is among MSM and transgender women, uh, uh, young adults in Chicago. And this graph shows the number of one-time sex partners that they've had. So you can see most people uh, are at zero, but there's a small percentage who have two, three, four, or, or five or more uh, one-time sex partners in the last six months. Now, in the STD world, we've often called this group uh, with the higher number of partners the core group. And the idea is that STDs, uh, certain STDs, like maybe syphilis or perhaps monkeypox, would not be sustained in the population without this higher activity core group. But we were talking about this one day and somebody said, you know, we have a cool name for this active group, the core group, but we don't have a name for this group of people with the zero partners. And that's where someone suggested we should call those people the Gettysburg Address Group 
because their last four scores were seven years ago. But that didn't uh, that didn't catch on. But I still like telling the story anyway. So the Prevention Effectiveness Fellowship at CDC. Uh, currently, there's 27 second year fellows. Um, and overall, there's 231 people who have uh, completed the fellowship since 1995. I came in in the second ever uh, PE fellowship class in 1996. And I'm one of the 86 alumni of the, the fellowship uh, working at CDC now. Most of the people on the fellowship uh, have a PhD in economics, but there's also other backgrounds as shown here. And the group's been very productive. For example, in 2021 alone, there were 220 uh, publications that included uh, a PE alum or, or a current fellow uh, on the author line. And um, when the PE fellows, former PE fellows were surveyed uh, about the question, I would not be here at CDC now had I not gone through the PE fellowship, 98% of the alumni agreed or strongly agreed. And I was one of those uh, who strongly agreed because uh, I'm a big fan of the PE fellowship having uh, gone through it and remained at CDC. So now the next topic. Um, Let's talk about uh, why CDC needs economists, and I'm going to use drunk drivers as my example for today. This is an article from the MMWR, which most of you are probably familiar with. It's the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, and this is from December of 1993. So you might wonder, why am I showing something 30 years old? There's two reasons. First, I wanted to go back from before the time that we had the Prevention Effectiveness Fellowship to a time when there wasn't much of an economics presence at CDC. Second, uh, the MMWR staff, uh, Charlotte Kent, the editor, and the, the whole crew there, they are just truly amazing uh, week after week after week with all the work they do to put this report out. And I think you have to go back 30 years to find an example of an article that has a major uh, omission in it, like the one I'm about to show you now in this example. So what this article did was look at, uh, it looked at reduction in alcohol-related traffic fatalities in 1990 uh, through 1992. And what was really surprising is in 1991 and 1992, there was this big drop in the number of alcohol-related traffic fatalities. So you can see it was uh, fairly steady uh, up and down in all these years before. And then all of a sudden, we have this biggest two-year decrease uh, ever recorded at, at the time. Now, the MMWR uh, talked about the reasons for this decrease, and they said, you know, it was things like prompt license suspensions for people who drive drunk, lower blood alcohol content, like a 0.06 instead of 0.10, um, and sobriety checkpoints and uh, educational type campaigns. But what the MMWR missed on this one, and it was a really big thing, is that in January 1st, 1991, we had the largest federal alcohol tax increase in history. And that undoubtedly was a very important and probably the most important factor behind this decline in the number of alcohol-related traffic fatalities. And economic studies done since then have indicated that this federal tax increase led to reductions not only in these alcohol-related traffic fatalities, but also in other alcohol-related outcomes such as suicides, homicides, and violent crimes. And the MMWR, I think, went on to redeem itself. This is a publication uh, from 2015 about alcohol impaired driving. And this MMWR uh, made the, uh, specifically cited the effect that alcohol taxes have on alcohol impaired driving. So now I'm going to move on to talking about cost effectiveness ratios. So an incremental cost effectiveness ratio, the basic idea behind it is very simple. It, it just uh, is, is how much do you get for the cost? And this ratio is calculated as, as the change in cost divided by the change in outcome as shown by the equation at the bottom of this slide. And this cost effectiveness ratio, the ICER as it's sometimes called, is usually expressed as the cost per health outcome gained. For example, you might read a study that says the cost per case of HIV averted, or the cost per life saved, or the cost per quality adjusted life year, or quality saved. Now, for those who don't know what a quality is, that's fine. I will get into that um, later on in the presentation and so that everyone uh, will know what a quality is. In a cost effectiveness paper, you might see a table such as this with a heading estimates of the cost, impact, and incremental cost per quality adjusted life year gained for three strategies. 
And there'll be numbers in this table. And what I want to do is to explain how these calculations are done. So when you see a table like this, you'll, you'll be able to make sense of it very easily. Now, as I mentioned, I'll get into qualities later. So for now, let's, let's not even talk about qualities. Let's keep this really simple. Let's think about uh, uh, purchasing bars of soap. So let's imagine that we're looking at um, uh, buying soap and we have two options. Um, we have a three pack of soap for $1.50 and a four pack of soap for $4. Um, ivory soap was the only one that I could find that had the, the sizes that I need, needed for this example. And you might recall that ivory had the logo uh, of being 99 and 44, 100% uh, pure. Uh, and so that's where the, the, uh, the outline heading came from for those who are wondering what that meant. But anyway, for a three pack of soap at $1.50, the average cost per bar, per bar would be 50 cents. And for a four pack of soap, the average cost per bar would be $1. But what economists uh, often look at is the incremental uh, cost. So what if we wanted to know what is the cost effectiveness of this four pack of soap compared to the three pack? So remember this uh, simple equation that we showed earlier, it's the change in costs divided by the change in outcomes. So what does that mean? So this three pack of soap versus the four pack of soap, the change in cost, if we buy the four pack instead of the three pack, it costs us $2.50 more. That's $4 minus $1.50. We also get one more bar of soap. We get four bars instead of three. So you could say the incremental cost effectiveness is $2.50 per bar of soap for the four pack. So what that means essentially is if we buy the four pack instead of the three pack, we're essentially paying uh, $2.50 more to get that one extra bar of soap. So what I've done here is to put those same simple results into this cost effectiveness table. And in a typical cost effectiveness table, usually in the very first column, you'll see the different um, options. So here I have uh, buying no soap or buying a three pack or buying a four pack. In a real table, you might see something like um, vaccinate 50% of the population uh, versus vaccinate 60% of the population and so on. Now, usually the very first uh, the very first row you see is a status quo scenario or a do nothing type of scenario. So what I've included here is more of a do nothing type scenario. So this shows what happens if we don't do anything. If we don't buy any soap, it doesn't cost us anything, but we don't get any bars of soap. <clears throat> so when we have the three pack, as I mentioned earlier, we have the cost and the, the three bars of soap shown here. Now, in a, in a table such as this, when you see incremental cost and incremental outcomes, what this means is you're comparing this row to the row immediately above it. So for the incremental outcomes for the three pack, they would be calculated as compared to the row just above it, the no soap row. So our incremental cost is the difference between zero and $1.50, which is $1.50. Our incremental outcome is the difference between zero bars and three bars. And then the incremental cost per bar of soap is 50 cents. And then for the four pack, we do the same thing. We compare it to the row immediately above it, which is the three pack. And this just shows the calculations that I did on the previous slide in which we pay an additional $2.50 for that additional bar of soap and have a $2.50 incremental cost per bar of soap. Now I'm just going to add one more option uh, to the mix. Let's say that we also have the option of buying a five pack of soap for $3.50. So how would this change the calculations? Well, when we have something like this in health e economics, what we do is we would say the four pack of soap is dominated by the five pack of soap. And what that means is the five pack is better in terms of price and it's better in terms of uh, the outcome. It's better in terms of price because it's cheaper, and it's better in terms of outcome because you get five uh, bars of soap instead of uh, four. So how does this affect our cost effectiveness table? So this is the same table that I showed you earlier, except I've added this bottom row for the five pack of soap. And what I've done now is to compare the five pack to the four pack. And I'm doing this to show that when we compare the five pack to the four pack, it makes the five pack look better than it actually is. And I'll explain what I mean by that. We have, um, when we compare a 350 cost to a $4 cost, the incremental cost is negative 50 cents. So this makes it look like we, uh, we have a negative uh, incremental cost for this uh, extra bar of soap. But the way we do uh, health uh, cost effectiveness studies is when you have a, a strategy that's dominated, 
you just remove it from the calculations and don't even consider it as an option. So in a cost effectiveness study, this four pack would be labeled as dominated or even removed from the table altogether. And then the five pack, instead of being compared to the strategy just above it, is compared to the, the uh, strategy above it that is not dominated, which is the three pack. So now the, the proper way to calculate the cost effectiveness of the five pack, as I said, is to compare it to the three pack. So the incremental cost is $2, calculated as the difference between $3.50 and $1.50. And the incremental outcome is two bars, calculated as the difference between five bars and three bars. And then the incremental cost per bar of soap is $1. And that's calculated as $2 divided by two. So now if you see the word dominated in a cost effectiveness table or a cost effectiveness paper, hopefully you'll have a better idea of, of what that means. So now we're going to move on to would you rather. And here is the section where we explain what uh, quality adjusted life years or qualies are. So a quality adjusted life year. The quality is a health measure that accounts for quality and length of life. One year in perfect health is one quality. Death is zero qualies. And if you live a year of life in less than perfect health, uh, then you accrue somewhere between zero and one quali. Quali weights. So the relative quality of life between zero and one that you have is often referred to as the quali weight or health utility. So some examples of quali weights that we use for human papillomavirus or HPV. Um, genital warts is giving a quali weight of 0.97. And what that means roughly is that someone who has genital warts, their quality of life is, is only 97% as high as it would be if they did not have genital warts. For those undergoing treatment for cervical cancer, their quality of life is only 70% as high as it would have been had they not uh, uh, had cervical cancer. The average background health-related quality of life tends to decrease uh, by age. This just shows some examples. Um, so for example, for the 18 to 64 year old age group, there's going to be some people who have uh, some, some health conditions that affect their quality of life and some, some who don't. But on average, we would say that the average person has a quality of life of 0.92. So like if we were to save someone's life in this age group, uh, by some type of intervention or vaccination uh, what, or whatever, on average, they would accrue 0.92 uh, qualies for each year uh, that they live. And then for the older age group, the, the average background quality, quality of life is a little bit lower. And again, these are averages. There are some people in the 65 and older group who are in perfect health and can run and jump and play and dance and, and, and do whatever they want. And there's some people in the younger age groups who have a much lower quality of life, but this is just some estimated averages uh, for these age groups as a whole. So you might wonder, how are these quality weights measured, like that 0.97 for genital warts that I was talking about? The quality weights typically are assessed from surveys. And the way these surveys do it is to ask questions that are called uh, the time trade-off questions, standard gamble questions, rating scales, and standardized questionnaires. And I'll give an example of each of these uh, shortly so you'll understand what they are. And then sometimes we get quality weights from other sources when there's not enough time to collect data um, or, or too expensive to collect the data we need, we might use expert opinion or we might use quality weights for uh, similar uh, conditions. So here's the point uh, in the in the seminar where if we have any, any volunteers who want to answer the would you rather questions, please uh, type your name in the Q&A box and indicate that you're willing uh, to answer or say, pick me, pick me, pick me or whatever. And um, we will try to coordinate that. We haven't done this before. Hopefully um, it will work. So, and hopefully we will have a volunteer. And there's actually two questions in there if you wanted to answer them chance that might fit in with your presentation not no big deal okay so should i answer these questions now or should we save them yeah if you want um okay oh, uh, and then as lillian unmutes actually lillian you ready to unmute you can unmute well let me um let me just go to the 
there is one question about why do we compute the, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio relative to the line above it instead of relative to the first line? And that's, that's a great question. So I want to I want to answer that when um, I'll answer that now while I have this table available. Hmm. When we say incremental, we're talking about what happens when you move from one strategy to the next. So the incremental cost effectiveness of, say, the five pack compared to the um, let me actually go back to the to this table to make it simpler. Um, the incremental outcome is what happens if we do the four pack instead of the three pack. We look at the incremental uh, difference because we wanna know is the four pack worth it relative to the three pack. Now we could compare the four pack to the, the very first line, the no soap. And that's what I did earlier when we talked about the average cost um, uh, per bar of soap. So a lot of times and you might see a table that has the incremental cost per bar of soap as well as the average cost per bar. And the average cost compares it to the, the first line and the incremental cost compares it to the line immediately above it. So hopefully that was, um, that was reasonably uh, clear. I hope I answered that question. So now we'll go to uh, the volunteers. Do we have a volunteer available? Yeah, go ahead, Nalene, if you wanna unmute that first person. Yes, Dr. Lima, you you are you should be able to talk now. Okay. Um, Hello, thank you for, for volunteering today. Are you ready for your question? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <hope> so. <laughs> so let's we'll ask you this. Would you rather would you rather live 30 more years with genital warts or 29 and a half more years without genital warts? Mm. Uh, 29.5 more years without. Okay. What if the question would have been 28 more years without genital warts versus 30 years with genital warts? Hmm. <laughs> uh, still the 28. Okay. What if it would have been 20 years without genital warts versus 30 years with genital warts? I guess 30 years. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for your responses. So what we showed there was um, different, you know, people might have different uh, amounts they're willing to trade off. So, so her trade off amount would be somewhere uh, above 20, but below 29.5. And if we had long enough, we could keep uh, asking that question over and over until we found out the uh, exact uh, trade off that she was willing to make. So thank you. And if we can get our next uh, volunteer on. Hello. Hello. So are you ready for your question? Oh, God. I thought I was going to so, get to do warts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so would you rather live 30 more years with your dominant arm amputated or live 23 more years without the amputation? Um, wow. I guess I'd rather live... 30 years without my dominant arm. Okay, what if the what if it were 28 years without the amputation? I'd rather live 28 years without okay. the amputation. So thank you. So so again if we had more time we could keep uh we could keep changing this trade off until we found out more precisely um, what the the trade off amount was. So thank you for for, for participating. <clears throat> so what these are, are uh, we can go ahead and, and chew up our next volunteer but uh, one of what this is called is a time trade-off question. And it simply examines the trade-offs people are willing to make between length of life and having a certain health condition. And with that information, we're able to estimate what the quality weight uh, of that uh, health condition, such as uh, amputation or genital warts um, is. So do we have one more volunteer? I'll volunteer. Okay. okay. So this one is the... Uh, Th th this is uh, suppose you have HIV and imagine there's a new pill that will cure HIV instantly, but there's a 95% chance the cure will work perfectly with no side effects, but there's a 5% chance of a sudden but painless death. Would you take that magic pill? Yeah, I would. You would. Okay. What if it were a 10% a, a chance of death and a 90% chance of success? Yeah, I still would. All right. What about 50-50? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, it'd take me a lot of analysis paralysis to figure that one out. Okay. <laughs> um, for the fun of it, uh, sure. Okay. 
What about a 5% chance of success and a 95% chance of death? No. Okay. So again, there's a point at which the person would not be willing to take that risk. So thanks uh, uh, for volunteering to the other volunteers. And what I did here, this is just called a standard gamble question, and it assesses the risk of death one is willing to accept to be rid of a certain health condition. And by uh, measuring that, that trade-off, we can get an estimate of what quality weight someone attaches to a certain health outcome. Now, we also have questions such as this where we would just ask people to directly rate their quality of life along the scale. Um, so this one asks people, suppose you suddenly experience uh, severe hearing loss, how would you rate uh, this? And, and their ranking along this scale gives us a pretty much a direct measurement of what they would perceive their quality, quality of life weight to be. And this is what's called a visual analog scale or a rating scale. And it asks um, respondents to rank the, the, the health condition along this scale. Now we also have questionnaires such as this, where we will ask people about their mobility and self-care. Um, for example, for mobility, we might ask them to, to report whether they have no problems in walking about, some problems, and if they're confined to bed. And from these, we can get a measure of their overall uh, health-related quality of life. So this is called a standardized questionnaire. The questions I have here are an excerpt of the one of the most famous ones called the Euroqual, Euroqual 5D which assesses uh, not only mobility and self-care, but also things like usual activities, pain, discomfort, and anxiety um, and depression. And this type of questionnaire can help us uh, measure the quality of life impact of various health outcomes. So uh, when we talk about a quality adjusted life year, how does that compare to just a standard life year? Well, again, qualities account for the quality and length of life, but when we talk just about regular life years, um, they only account for the length of life, not the quality of life. So if you're alive, you accrue one life year, regardless of whether you're in excellent health or very poor health, and, and death um, is equal to zero life years. This is just an example for human papillomavirus vaccination. Um, HPV vaccination can prevent a lot of HPV-related health outcomes, including genital warts and cervical cancer. Genital warts can affect your quality of life, but it's not fatal, so it won't affect your length of life. Cervical cancer, on the other hand, can affect your quality of life as well as your length of life because it can be fatal. So when we talk about the health out impact of genital warts or the health impact of cervical cancer or cervical cancer treatment, the quality measure would pick up these detriments to health, but the life year measure would not. Now, when someone dies of an, of an outcome like a cervical cancer death, the life year measure does pick up this death but, and the quality measure does as well. But if, if we have someone, say, who survives cervical cancer but has a, a temporary or permanent reduction in their quality of life as a result of the treatment or the disease, this would be reflected in the quality measure but not in the measure of life years. So that's why we use qualities quite often in public health is to, to measure this effect of um, health impacts that are not fatal. So now to give examples of how quality weights are calculated, I'll move on to Bart Simpson and genital warts. So let's say, for example, how do we want to estimate the number of qualities that are gained by an HPV vaccination program? What we do a lot of times is we'll use mathematical models to estimate the incidence of these HPV health outcomes uh, with and without HPV vaccination. And a common approach is to examine a very long term, like 100 years of a program, because uh, HPV vaccination takes a long time for all the benefits to be realized. Vaccination of a 12 year old girl now can prevent can prevent cervical cancer when she's 70 years old, for example. And using quality weights for these HPV outcomes, we can count the number of qualities in the United States with and without HPV vaccination. And we can compare the vaccination scenario to the no vaccination scenario and look at the difference in the number of qualities. And from that, we can calculate the number of qualities gained by HPV vaccination. Now, it would be really complicated to show you all these models and talk about uh, population level uh, quality of life measures. So what I want to do is just show a real quick, simple example of how many qualities might be gained if we vaccinate Bart and Lisa Simpson. 
So for those who don't know, The Simpsons is a, is a cartoon show that's been on for about 30 years. And Bart and Lisa, shown in the middle here, they've been about 10 years and eight years, respectively, uh, for the duration of their show. But let's assume they were to grow up and we were to vaccinate them uh, with HPV vaccine in 2025. We can use models to estimate Bart and Lisa's quality of life for each remaining year of life. And we can estimate what we might expect that to be with vaccination and without vaccination. And by, by comparing those two scenarios, we can estimate um, how many qualities we expect to gain by uh, vaccinating them with the HPV vaccine. So HPV vaccination can reduce uh, a lot of adverse health outcomes, uh, including those shown here. Uh, for example, in women, genital warts, cervical cancer, vaginal cancer, uh, and so on, and also genital warts in men and cancers uh, in men. Now, you might be vaccinated and still get one of these outcomes, and you might be unvaccinated and avoid all these outcomes. But on average, your risk of these outcomes is reduced substantially through HPV vaccination, and the models can take that into account. Now, there's a lot of different possible scenarios of what might happen to Bart and Lisa over their lifetime. So let's just look at two specific scenarios. Let's look at a scenario where Bart has genital warts and Lisa has cervical cancer. And we'll look at a scenario where Bart and Lisa have none of these HPV outcomes. So this is the scenario in which Lisa is being treated for cervical cancer and Bart has genital warts in 2045. So their age would be uh, 32 and 34, respectively. And as, as I showed earlier, uh, we would expect in this age group that there's a chance they might have some other health issues that affect their quality of life. So we'll say their background quality of life would be 0.92. Now for Lisa, as a, uh, as a result of having cervical cancer, um, her quality of life weight for cervical cancer is 0.7. So what that means is we take her, what her quality of life would have been 0.92, and multiply it by this quality weight for cervical cancer, which is 0.7, and that gives us 0.64. So Lisa in 2045 would accrue 0.64 qualities if she had cervical cancer. We do the same type of calculation for Bart. He would have had 0.92 qualities in the absence of these HPV outcomes, but since he had genital warts, and we assign a quality weight of 0.97 for genital warts, we estimate that his quality of life is 0.92 times 0.97, which gives us 0.89. So Bart in 2045 would accrue 0.89 qualities. So in 2045, Bart and Lisa accrue 1.53 qualities in two life years. So the next slide will be uh, similar, but we're going to, to move on to the, the, uh, the sad occasion in which Lisa has uh, passed away. So in this scenario, Lisa is no longer alive in this year. And as a result, she does not accrue any qualities or any life years. Bart is still alive. And unfortunately, his genital warts have persisted. And this calculation is the same as on the previous slide. So in this scenario, Bart and Lisa accrue 0.89 qualities in 2046. And this is all attributable uh, to the 89 qualities that Bart accrued. So it's sad to think of Lisa uh, passing away. So let's move on to the happier scenario. Um, this is the scenario that's much more likely if they're vaccinated, which is no HPV disease. So in this scenario, um, their quality of life is assumed to be 0.92 in the absence of HPV. And since they don't have any HPV outcomes, that's exactly uh, the quality of life that we assign, 0.92. And in 2045, Bart and Lisa accrue 1.84 qualities. That's calculated as the 0.92 plus the 0.92. And they account for two life years in this scenario. So that just gives you an example of uh, how these quality weights are done and, and how the number of qualities are calculated. So I hope now when you see a cost effect in the study that talks about the number of uh, the cost per quality gained, you might have a better understanding of how these calculations were done. So now the next section is CDC economists are not nice. And what I'm using this section for is to talk about the question we often get, what is the threshold for determining cost effectiveness? So in this example, uh, nice, refers to the National Institute for Health and Care Excellent and Excellence. And this is a national advisory body in the UK that provides guidance and support to the national health services. And typically medicines and treatments that cost less than 20,000 uh, pounds uh, 
or, or possibly 30,000 pounds per quali are considered cost effective. And in the UK, this uh, cost effectiveness ratio threshold is much more binding. Um, it's, uh, there are some exceptions, but in general, if the, if the medicines and treatments don't meet this threshold for cost effectiveness, they're typically not offered by the National um, Health Service. So um, the CDC, in contrast, is not like NICE. There is no official CDC threshold for determining cost effectiveness. So there's no consensus on the appropriate cost per quality threshold for determining the cost effectiveness of a public health intervention like uh, vaccination or uh, uh, cervical cancer screening or diabetes prevention or things like that. Um, so it's not just CDC, there's no US government threshold. Um, if you want, I, I have some references here for those who want to read more about it, but um, there's also discussion of uh, federal legislation that seems to actually uh, prohibit the use of a specific threshold for cost per quality uh, ratios which means that we can use cost per quality to inform decisions, but we wouldn't have a strict cutoff and say that uh, there's, there's a strict rule that you cannot offer a, a health intervention that has a, a cost effect in this uh, cost per quality gained above a certain threshold. Now in the literature, 50,000 to, 50, to $100,000 is often cited as being the official uh, threshold, but um, this has been described as arbitrary and lacking empirical or theoretical justification. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, um, I think they're the best example of how cost effectiveness, or a very good example, I should say, of how cost effectiveness analysis does influence uh, uh, decision making at CDC. The ACIP provides guidance regarding the use of vaccines in the United States. They've uh, made the news a lot more uh, ever since COVID. They're often re referred to as the CDC Advisory Group or something like that, or the CDC Committee instead of the full name uh, in the newscast. But anyway, the ACIP charter is shown here, and it specifically says that economic analyses should be in, uh, considered in the committee uh, deliberations. So um, I think there's a, a lot of good examples of how cost effectiveness analyses have helped to guide uh, the vaccine decisions to make sure that uh, we, when a vaccine is recommended, that it's a, a good use of public health resources. The next section is don't be negative. And I'll explain what I mean by this. And, and I'll start off with an example. This is a study that was done a, a, a while back on uh, the cost effectiveness of flu vaccination. And it includes uh, some CDC authors and some longtime CDC collaborators. What I've put here is an excerpt from the article abstract. And I just wanted to point out that in their abstract, they report a few cost effectiveness ratios, such as $12,000 per quality gained for vaccination of children ages 6 to 23 months, and $119,000 per quality gained for children ages 12 to 17 years. And for children um, at high risk ages 3 to 7 years, um, it was $1,000 to $10,000 per quality. What I want to call your attention to is, is this specific uh, result here, they indicate that children vaccinating children at high risk ages six to 35 months was cost saving. And as I'll explain shortly, that means that the cost effectiveness ratio was negative. But I want to point out that they didn't actually present the negative number. They didn't say like it cost negative $40,000 per quality or negative $100,000 per quality. And I'll explain why that is uh, coming up. But just as an example, what is a cost-saving intervention? And I'll give an, uh, give an example here. There was a HIV self-testing program that was estimated to cost $450,000 to deliver. And that included the HIV test kits that were needed uh, for this, the home self-testing. It was estimated that uh, there were about three or four new HIV cases that were averted by the program because when people test positive, they can uh, get into treatment and the new treatments can reduce their risk or even eliminate their risk of uh, passing the infection on to others when they, when they are fully suppressed through the antiretroviral therapies. So by averting these three or four HIV cases, it's estimated that the program saved about $1.5 million in lifetime cost. So since the cost averted by the program, $1.5 million, exceed the cost of the program, about $450,000, this is said to be a cost-saving intervention. So if the medical cost averted by an intervention exceed the cost of the intervention, 
the cost effectiveness ratio is negative, you could say that the program pays for itself. Now, as I mentioned earlier, negative cost effectiveness ratios are often reported as being less than zero or simply as being cost saving. For example, we would say the vaccination program was cost saving or the cost per quality gained by the program was less than zero dollars. We typically do not say something like the vaccine program costs negative four hundred thousand dollars per quality gained. And I'll explain why that is in the next slide. But I do want to point out before moving forward that programs can be cost effective without being cost saving. You know, just because a program doesn't pay for itself in averted medical costs, it doesn't mean it's not um, of, of value. So why is the magnitude of a negative cost effective ratio not particularly meaningful? Here's an example of three hypothetical vaccines, X, Y, and Z. So let's imagine that vaccine X saves us $8 million uh, by averting uh, medical costs, and we gain four qualities. So if we were to calculate the cost per quality gained, it would be negative 8 million divided by four or negative $2 million per quality. So you might think, well, if we save more money, then we'll have a negative, neg bigger negative number. Isn't that a better thing? Well, yes, that would be a better thing. So if we saved $16 million instead of 8 million, then the, co the cost per quality gain would be negative $4 million. But we have to take into account though, the cost effectiveness ratio includes not only the cost in the numerator, but also the effect in the denominator. So in this example for vaccine Z, it might save $8 million, but only gain two qualities instead of four. And if that were the case, the cost per quality gained would be negative 4 million. So as you can see, vaccine Y is better than vaccine X, but vaccine Z is worse than vaccine X. So the fact that it has a negative $4 million uh, cost per quality doesn't really tell you uh, much because you don't know whether the, the number is changing because you're saving more money or because you're preventing or you're gaining uh, less health. So now I'll move on to the mega million uh, jackpot and discounting. So uh, many of you might have seen the, the mega millions jackpot in the news lately. Um, there was one winner, I think. I can't remember where, maybe uh, Illinois. But th there were two options for the winner. They could take an initial payment and 29 annual payments totaling $1.3 trillion, or they could take an immediate lump sum payment of $780 million. And I don't know if the person has made uh, their choice yet, um, but most lottery winners choose the lump sum uh, immediate payout. And that's because people prefer being paid today versus next year. All else equal, we prefer uh, to have uh, immediate versus delayed gratification. That's just uh, human nature. So imagine that you want uh, $1 million even. Uh, would you rather have that money today or one year from now? So it's just for most every person having that $1 million today is much more valuable than having it one year from now. So um, all else equal, receiving a payment today is more valuable than receiving that payment in the future. So what we do in cost effectiveness analyses is we take these future costs and benefits and we discount them to present value. And this is a standard practice uh, in economics uh, and in accounting. And I'll give an example of how we do this to, that might help make it uh, make you see how discounting is done so it won't be uh, as confusing, I hope. So here's an example of a 3% annual discount rate. And what this means is that future costs and outcomes are reduced by 3% each year all the way back to the, the current year. So let's suppose we have a program that prevents diabetes and it's estimated to save uh, 10 qualities in the first year, 20 qualities in the second year, 40 qualities in the third year, and 100 qualities in the fourth year. If we add that up, that's 170 qualities over the four years. But these are when we don't discount them. So let's say, okay, we wanna discount them to present value. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna discount them back to the very first year. So for the ones that happen in the second year, we need to discount them one year to get them back to the first year. To do so, we would just divide by 1.03. And that's because, again, we're assuming a 3% annual discount rate. You can assume 5% or 10% or 1%, but typically 3% is, is used in the U.S. as uh, for, for cost-effectiveness studies. Now, for the year three qualities, we would need to discount them back two years uh, to get them back to year one. So we would divide by 1.03 times 1.03. 
And similarly, uh, for the year four qualities, we would have to discount them three years to get them back to uh, the first year, so the present value. And that would be 100 divided by 1.03 times 1.03 times 1.03, and that gives us uh, 91.5. So what this is saying really is if, if you think about it, if you reduce something by 3% a year for three years, then your, your resulting value is about 9% less um, than what you started with. So the 100 qualities not discounted uh, is, is roughly equal to about 91.5 qualities when they are discounted. So I wanted to give an example. Uh, I think sometimes actually seeing how the calculations are done helps some people understand uh, what discounting is. So now I'll move on uh, to what my favorite part of the presentation is. Uh, it's, it's not just about the money. And here is where I just want to talk briefly about what economists do besides cost effectiveness. And this gives uh, even more reasons why uh, CDC needs health economists. So the cost related studies are just usually the tip of the iceberg, even though people think about cost and cost effectiveness and resource allocation when they think about health economics. There's a lot of studies that health e economists can contribute to, such as studies regarding health behaviors and receipt of health services. Um, as assessing the effects of an intervention, program, or policy, um, estimating the incidence of disease or some other health outcome, um, looking at health equity issues, and just a wide range of other quantitative studies. And I'll give just a few examples here. Um, I'll give more recent examples. This one is um, uh, about 20 years old, but the reason I'm using it is just, it's my, my favorite one of my favorite health economic studies of all time. And what the authors did was to look at the economic gains resulting from uh, reduction in children's exposure to lead in the United States, you know, for uh, the, the switch uh, to unleaded fuels, for example, and the other measures that we've taken. The idea is that uh, lead affects children's development. Um, if we get rid of the lead, the children are healthier, uh, they're, uh, they have higher IQs, and as a result, they're more uh, productive over their lifetime. And what this study did was just estimate what is that uh, uh, lifetime earnings productivity difference and, and what's the benefit we gained by, by reducing exposure to lead. And they estimate, estimated that for each birth cohort, you know, about 3.8 million kids are born each year, the benefits to getting rid of the, the or reducing the lead was about 110 billion to 319 billion over the lifetime of each of these cohorts. And this was back in 2002. So if we adjusted for inflation, it would be even bigger. The reason I like this example so much is that a lot of times people think of public health measures as, as being uh, counterproductive to the economy. But I think there's so many examples where public health measures actually improve economic efficiency. You know, people who are smarter, um, and healthier, and happier tend, tend to be more productive than those who are not uh, all three of those things. Here is another one that looked uh, that looked at the effect of a policy on economic activity, and this one examined face mask mandates. And what the study found in general was that um, when we started to reopening reopening businesses um, after shutting uh, down during the uh, the early phases of uh, COVID, that there was a rebound in in uh, consumer spending. But the rebound was actually more pronounced in the states that had a face mask mandates than those without. And the evidence suggested that having these face mask, ma face mask mandates could actually be uh, beneficial to the economy. Now, here's one that looked at uh, statewide mask mandates uh, and the effect on a health outcome, the decline in COVID-19 hospitalization uh, growth rates. So this study has nothing to do with cost, but it shows um, that economists uh, can, can work with, with large data sets to uh, examine health outcomes. This is one I worked on. Um, I think it's an interesting example that Austin Williams did, um, looking at the impacts of federal prevention funding on reported gonorrhea and chlamydia rates. And What's interesting about this is it's very hard to estimate what the impact of STD prevention activities is on STD rates. And a lot of times we use mathematical transmission models to estimate this, and these can be very informative. But sometimes people want uh, more direct evidence. And what this paper did was say, OK, let's just look and see, is there a link between the money that CDC gives the states for STD prevention? Is there a link between that money and subsequent declines in 
uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia rates. And this study found, yes, there is, that uh, each 1% increase in funding for STD prevention was associated with subsequent decreases in chlamydia and gonorrhea rates of about 0.17 and 0.33%. Uh, so it's very powerful evidence to show that there's a direct link between the resources invested and the outcome that you see. So now briefly, just to show a few more examples of the types of studies that health uh, economists have done at CDC. Um, this one, uh, the health economists, most uh, or many of the health economists at CDC, I'm not one of them, are very skilled at analyzing large data sets and such as medical claims data. And these types of studies of the medical claims data can, can be very insightful. For example, this study showed the link between body mass index and the risk for COVID-19 hospitalization and uh, ICU admission, and so on. This is one that uh, Kai Hong did, um, looking at how the COVID uh, pandemic caused a decline in the receipt of vaccines by uh, Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, if people didn't want to leave the house and they weren't going to the doctor to get their usual vaccines. Um, this paper looked at uh, Medicaid enroll enrollees who were trying to quit smoking to determine if they were getting the cess cessation treatments that they were supposed to be getting. Again, this has uh, not cost related, but it's an example of a health related type of study that uh, health economists can do. Economists also do some, some modeling work such as this, where, which estimated the number of cases and hospitalizations averted by COVID-19 case investigation and contact tracing. And as I mentioned, uh, economists have, have even looked at um, racial and ethnic disparities and health equity issues. This one looked at racial and ethnic disparities in COVID-19 vaccination coverage. And now there's quite a few studies that have shown that there's disparities by race and ethnicity in COVID-19 vaccination coverage. What made this one special is that it, in looking at the factors that were associated with these disparities, it was able to attribute uh, the, the estimated percentage of these disparities that, that was due to uh, a certain socioeconomic or demographic factor. So that gives us a new way of looking at this and perhaps maybe uh, gives us ways to better address these disparities so that we can improve uh, vaccination coverage for everyone. So just to summarize what I've been talking about today, I hope that I've conveyed the idea that CEC economists conduct a wide range of quantitative analyses. It does include cost effectiveness analyses, but we do a lot more than that. And that the Prevention Effectiveness Fellowship has been instrumental in building this capacity. Um, hopefully, um, I've shown that the basic idea behind cost effectiveness is very simple. It's what do you get for the cost? Um, I went over some of the, the key background uh, or so some of the key issues related with cost effectiveness, such as um, showing how the cost effectiveness ratio is calculated as the change in cost divided by the change in outcome, the quality of life years, quality adjusted life years or qualies account for the quality and length of life. Um, I've pointed out that there's no official CDC threshold for determining uh, cost effectiveness and that an intervention is cost saving if it pays for itself and averted medical costs. Um, the magnitude of a negative cost effectiveness ratio is not usually meaningful um, and interventions need not be cost saving to be cost effective. The reason we spend money is to improve our health, not necessarily to reduce uh, medical expenses, although that's a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful benefit as well. So again, I want to uh, thank the organizers um, and uh, I thank everyone for attending today and we can open it up now uh, for questions. Thanks, Dr. Chesson. I appreciate it. I really like that. Uh, it was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, there's a huge, there's a whole host of, of questions in there. Uh, I was wondering if briefly you could talk a little bit a bit about um, uh, advances in in uh, computational capacity and modeling and the use of um, machine learning or other applications. One of our one of our events this year for the program is to learn a lot more about data science. And I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on that before you answer some of the other questions. Yes, I, th I think definitely. Uh... I've, I've given a lot of HPV examples because I've worked with human papillomavirus vaccination quite a bit. So I think um, 
I can give another HPV example. We've worked a lot um, with some modelers at Laval University in Canada who have developed a very detailed uh, individual based uh, model of HPV. So what that means is they kind of keep track of single individuals and uh, you know hundreds of thousands and how they interact uh, with the sexual mixing and their probabilities of acquiring HPV and the probability of being screened for cervical cancer and so on. It's very detailed. And I think uh, in years past, maybe when I first started at CDC, that model wouldn't even be pop possible because of the computational requirements. But now, uh, now it's, it's able to be done uh, much more quickly and it can run many simulations. Um, so that has greatly improved our ability to do these these very detailed types of models. And then uh, adding on to that, our, with the advent of applications and other things, with people being able to put their individual factors into into um, applications, I would imagine that the field has grown into a lot more. I'm not say utility, but like. Uh, how palatability or usability as far as individual users? Are, are you involved in any of that or aware of any of that? Or the use of more complex economic models that as they apply to the individual, sort of like you're talking about in, but in an app form or a generally public and consumable bot or type form? Well, uh, in the in the center where I work, the, where we have uh, HIV, uh, tuberculosis, um, and hepatitis, and sexually transmitted diseases, and the Division of Adolescent Health, um, we we have a cooperative agreement with a group with groups of modelers uh, at various uh, across the country, really. But um, they've worked to to help us improve our modeling capacity uh, for STDs and HIV and these other outcomes. And one of the things that, that has been done through this cooperative agreement is to develop tools where the models are developed and then put into a user-friendly spreadsheet so that uh, maybe people at state health departments or local health departments can put in information about their program and get some model-based uh, outcomes uh, that they wouldn't have been able to do uh, on their own uh, given, you know, that it's very it's very hard to do these types of models. Um, it's incredible. So, so that's an example of making of getting models out there for people to use. I think that would that really does facilitate the use of models and cost effectiveness. Thank you. Um, give you a chance to read through things if you have question and answers if you want. Uh, and again, if you have any questions and answers, there's a Q&A box on the bottom. You can submit your questions. You can use the check anonymously box if you don't want to have your name associated with them. And we'll, we'll pick out a couple. We had a number of, of attendees this won't go around and we'll have a number of questions, but we'll get to them as we can. I also want to thank our participants too for, for interacting live. That's the first time we did that. So I appreciate that. So I see one question about, do we have um, good models that establish the positive impact of prevention uh, of TB and STD HIV prevention? Um, so if I understand that correctly, um, I would say yes. As I mentioned, the, the cooperative agreement um, for modeling that we have in our center um, has looked a lot at TB and uh, STD and HIV prevention. So we have a lot of uh, models to examine the impact uh, of these activities. So um, I don't know the best way to, to follow up on this, but we can certainly pass along some examples um, of these modeling studies. Someone said, um, aren't there costs uh, to doing nothing? Um, yes, yes, there certainly are. And, and a lot of times, um, what we do in the examples like like I was giving of the, the soap and the no soap, um, we just look at the added cost of the activity we're looking at, such as whether you buy soap or not. I think the best way to think about um, are there costs to doing nothing um, is the Bart and Lisa Simpson example with the HPV. So if we, if we don't vaccinate, we don't uh, we don't incur the cost associated with vaccination, but we do. Uh, incur the cost associated with the treatment of the uh, the medical treatment of the HPV associated outcomes that might happen as a result. Someone asks um, in the trade off questions for qualities, do you ask both people who do have the condition and those who, who don't? 
um, in that they imagine it would be difficult to accurately guess, uh, what, you know, when, for someone who doesn't have the condition. And that's certainly true. What's been found actually is when you ask people about the quality of life impact of a, a given health condition, people who have the health condition uh, score their quality of life higher than people who, who, who don't. So for example, if you asked people what their quality of life would be if they lost their eyesight, people who, people who, who do not have any vision problems, they would rank their quality of life without eyesight as very, very low. Whereas when you ask people who have lost their eyesight, they're typically rank their quality of life as much better than that. So, um, so a lot of times um, people who have the condition don't see it as a big of a deal as people who don't have the condition. Another person asks, are disability adjusted life years commonly used in cost effectiveness analysis? And the answer is yes, but uh, a lot of that is typically in international settings. Um, typically in higher income countries like the US and in, in Europe, uh, you see cost studies done in terms of cost per quality gained and the, the cost, cost per dollar is, is a lot of times done in, in lower income settings, but that's not uh, it doesn't have to be that way. You can you can uh, use qualities or dollies, uh, however you wish. Uh, they're very similar in some ways and different in others. Um, I think it's for the most part uh, your your finding as to whether something was cost effective or not uh, would not likely be dependent on whether you used a quality adjusted life year or a disability adjusted life year. But I'm sure there's there's some exceptions. So someone uh, noted uh, people assess health health risks uh, differently. So how you know how is the accuracy of qualities uh, insured or evaluated? Um, there are definitely uh, steps that people take when they're measuring qualities to try to 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 remove as many biases as they can. Um, I would have to consult with an expert in these quality measurements to to give a better answer than that, but. One thing I can say though is, is a lot of times these, these measures of the quality weights don't have too big of an impact on the cost effectiveness. And this is particularly true when you're looking at preventing an outcome that can be fatal because uh, when you look at saving lives, the quality weights don't come into account for, for uh, when, when death uh, comes into play because a quality uh, is zero when someone dies. So um, one example of when it does come into play was when we were looking at um, HPV vaccination, we started off vaccinating uh, only uh, young, only uh, adolescent girls for uh, several years. And then we added boys to the HPV vaccination program. So the cost effectiveness of adding, the incremental cost effectiveness of adding boys to an existing girls vaccination program, it depended quite a bit on the assumptions that were applied regarding the impact of genital warts on quality of life, because that was one of the main outcomes that was uh, pre prevented uh, in men. And um, our estimates were not very precise, so we just used a wide range, and when we used the upper bound uh, estimate, the biggest, if, if, if warts had a really big effect on quality of life, then the cost per quality gained by male vaccination was est estimated to be lower than if we assumed that it had virtually uh, no real impact on quality of life. So, uh, Tony, should I just keep going through more of these, or is there another uh, process we should use? Or? As, you, as you see fit. Um... I'm trying to pick out we have such a, a, a wide breadth of questions about them. Uh, if you find ones that, that you liked. Okay, and if you, if you happen to see any that come up a lot and want to pass them along, let me know. Um, yeah. So someone, um, someone asked, how do you account for things like general warts that facilitate, facilitate other conditions like H, HIV that impact quality of life? Uh, that's a that's a great question, and and we do this sometimes, like, uh, like in the STD world. So, for example, if someone has uh, an STD like syphilis or gonorrhea or chlamydia or general herpes, it's much more likely that if they have HIV by having this other STD, they're more likely to transmit HIV. And if they don't have HIV, when they have these other STDs like syphilis or gonorrhea, they're more likely to acquire HIV. That is, these other STDs. 
facilitate the transmission. It might make someone with HIV more infectious, or it can make someone without HIV more susceptible. And in some of our cost effectiveness studies, we take this into account. We can use uh, models of STD um, uh, transmission that include HIV and estimate that effect um, directly. So not all studies of STDs take into account the possible benefits of preventing HIV by preventing uh, these other STDs, but some do. Okay, um, so someone said in the Bart and Lisa example, at what point would the quality weight be adjusted for the probability of getting cervical cancer or genital warts while assessing the impact of the HPV vaccine? So what I showed in the Bart and Lisa example, I showed a scenario in which they didn't have any HPV outcomes, and I showed a scenario in which Lisa had cervical cancer and Bart had genital warts. Now, there's tons of other possible uh, outcomes that we didn't look at. For example, uh, Lisa might have genital warts and Bart not, might not have anything. Or Lisa's cervical cancer might have been detected through screening and treated and not had it uh, led to a fatal outcome. Um, and the models that we have actually take into account every single one of these possible permutations and combinations, and they figure out you know, how likely each one is. So the model I was talking about that we do with Canadian models, modelers that's, that's so complicated is it, 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 it runs uh, uh, you know, thousands, thousands of times and, look, and, 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 and takes into account all these possible outcomes. And, and then we can look at, on average, what is the benefit of HPV vaccination, HPV vaccination versus no HPV vaccination? And, and then to follow on with one of those is uh, there is a discussion about thresholds for herd immunity in vaccinated populations. And so I'd imagine that involves uh, like almost a, a, a very dynamic modeling environment in some way, right? Yes. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, yeah. uh, so, um, yeah, herd immunity is is in the in the modeling world, um, and I hope the the proper modelers will will not will will not think I bungled this too badly. But there there's two points to make. There's one a lot of times what we we talk about a, a herd immunity threshold, and what we mean by that is what percentage of the population do you need to vaccinate in order to to uh, to uh, pretty much effectively rid the population of the of sustained transmission. So that's so we might say if we can get, I'm just making this number up, but if say we can get uh, flu vaccination coverage to 70 or 80 percent, we'll have herd protection. That's just a made up number. So that's what we mean by the herd immunity threshold. But one thing that's important to remember in these models of STD transmission is even if we only say vaccinate 10 percent of the population, that's still going to have some benefits in protecting other people, even if it doesn't bring about herd immunity. So even though there's still STD spread in the population, even if we vaccinate, say, 10 percent or 20 percent of the people, we still have some indirect uh, protection benefits. Um, and those are accounted for uh, in these in the types of models that I mentioned earlier. One other one that get, might get more in the weeds is the one-way versus probabilistic sensitivity analyses and the use of one application versus another. That might be a weedy question, but... Yes, um, well, I'm glad somebody asked that because um, I originally had a slide of things that I left off, um, but I didn't want to have too many slides. But um, one of the things I was going to say is that uh, all studies should have a sensitivity analysis. Um, and what we mean by that is you look at how your results change when you change some of your, uh, your key assumptions. So, and, and not only that, you look at um, how your results change, might change due to, to chance alone, or how much your results might change. Uh, you, uh, when, when you vary some of your assumptions from one value to another. For example, we might not know the probability of syphilis transmission per partnership, but we might know it's somewhere between 0.3 and 
five, just for example. In a sensitivity analysis, we could look and we could vary that from 0.3 to 0.5 to see if that affects our estimates of the cost effectiveness of a syphilis prevention intervention. Now, what a probabilistic sensitivity analysis does is, is it, it repeats the analysis, you know, maybe a hundred times, a thousand times, or 10,000 times, whatever. And each time it, 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 it uses, for every, for every relevant uh, assumption, that you're varying, it, it draws a different value for that based on what you think the plausible upper bound and lower bound of, of that is. And it does get into the weeds a little bit, but um, in, in many studies, uh, probabilistic sensitivity analysis really is the best way to look at the uncertainty in the model. Um, but there's some cases where it's not as, as valuable. Mm -hmm. I'll let you read through if you want. I have, I have one or two more, but if you want to pick up. Yeah, them. yeah, it's easier if, if you pass them on to me, so please do. All right, this is a, a bit different of a, an approach, but what if we took, uh, it really relates to communication, right? Communication of, of your findings to an audience that makes them palatable and actionable. And particularly we had an alumni, alumnus from a, a local health department that says, I get qualities. All, all these values, but how do you, in your experience, how do you make them digestible to the public? Hard. Yes, I think a lot of times um, when we have when we have cost effectiveness studies, like like we say, you know, the cost per quality gained was such and such. I think it's good sometimes to unpack that uh, depending on your audience. So um, sometimes in the STD world, for example, we might not uh, we we might not. Uh, for a certain audience, we might not say we gain this many qualities. What we'll say is this program was estimated to avert, you know, 200 syphilis cases and 500 gonorrhea cases, and put it in those terms rather than put it into the quality of life terms. Because a lot of times we need the cost per quality just uh, in order to have that estimate so we can compare it to other public health interventions. But if we just want to convey the impact of an intervention, a lot of times we can use these intermediate outcomes like the number of cases averted or the number of lives saved or something like that, because people can understand that much, much more easily than uh, what a quality is. And, and um, yeah, I think one of the, the things that comes up at, at the agency at times is not that do we have the data, but how do we make that data and how do we make it actionable and interpretable towards for people to, to do something with it. Uh, I remember someone came from Google a number of years ago and said, oh, we're gonna look at a thousand patients over the course of uh, a span. And, and it's really not necessarily about having the large sets of data. It's really about trying to tell people what to do with that and, and how to interpret their findings rather than the other. Um, there was a question about diagnosis related groups, DRGs. And I don't know if you have any experience in that with the, the past about, I think it's a little bit more of an insurance type question, but was there economic studies that you're aware of and that, that came, that developed the DRGs? That I would not uh, be able to come up with a, any kind of sensible answer for. So um, maybe we can follow up by putting them in touch with someone who would have an answer for that. No problem. Um, and then uh, you talked about this a little bit, but one of the time uh, about time horizons and cost effectiveness analysis, the EAs, and 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 really selection. Um, um, it says, what what if the rate of decline in vaccine effectiveness is unknown, or is CAs typically performed over a short period of time? Any thoughts about how that occurs? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is particularly important uh, when we have a new vaccine um, because. Typically, when a, when a vaccine is new, we only have a few years of the, the randomized control trial data. So we might be only we might only be able to say for sure that uh, the duration is, say, three years or whatever. Um, again, I'll use HPV as an, as an example. When the HPV vaccine first came out, we wanted to we needed to assume make assumptions for the models about how long the protection would be. And what the experts suggested was they thought that it would be very long lasting and that it would be reasonable uh, as a starting point to assume uh, even a lifetime protection from the HPV vaccines or at least 20 years. So a lot of the early models for HPV vaccination, we assumed lifetime duration of protection, but we used the sensitivity analyses where we assumed a shorter duration, like what if it only works for 10 years 
or 20 years. And thankfully, the 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 experts have been proven right so far. Um, after all these years, the, the more data we have now for HPV, we're still not seeing any signs of, of decline uh, in protection after all these years. So it's looking like it will provide the long-term protection that was assumed early on. But the simple answer is it's important when you don't know the duration of protection to uh, to vary that in the sensitivity analysis. <laughs> And, and I, I was talking with uh, Adam Skelton about this a little bit earlier on, and particularly with uh, pandemic preparedness. And we had spent a, a great deal of money at the agency modeling for pandemic preparedness and distribution models and all those things. Um, and then when a pandemic came, I, I would imagine there's a increasingly rich literature about what worked and what didn't it went as we go and, and uh, model model what could have happened and then what actually happened is, is probably fascinating from an economic standpoint yes uh, <laughs> definitely uh, um and then the the last question then we'll probably close is is about applications in other settings so one of the things we'll run into is oh this works in my uh, jurisdiction state county city country but it doesn't work in another one. And I, I think you spoke a little bit about that, but maybe a little bit more about this work across, you mentioned Canada and other modeling groups and their applicability or generalizability across populations. Yeah, I mean, I think knowing knowing the population, uh, it makes a huge difference. Um, I'm trying to think of some examples um, from our center and in, in the modeling that we've done here. Um, but uh, but I think HIV gives us an example. Like we we want to find people who have HIV and don't know they're infected, and bring them to treatment so that we can improve their health and act, and help prevent them from from uh, spreading the infection uh, further. But I think uh, the benefits of these types of programs depend on uh, a lot of uh, a lot of that continuum continuum along the way, like what percentage of people already know that they're HIV infected and, you know, what percentage of people, if they find out, will be, will have access uh, to care and will be able to maintain being on HIV therapy and so on. So I think the populations that you look at, uh, that determines a lot of the, the potential benefits and cost effectiveness of a given, uh, say, HIV uh, prevention type of intervention like that. And, and it probably it makes me think that the sensitivity analyses are particularly important in those sections of those papers because it it talks uh, it talks about whether a certain aspect was uh, how that affected the model and so say your population awareness of hiv differs or or culturally differs in some manner maybe one could go back to a paper and say oh okay like this would generally be applicable because our populations are are similar in these ways and dissimilar yeah and, and i think maybe a, a much simpler example might be what's the cost effectiveness of chlamydia screening and that would depend a lot on what chlamydia prevalence is in the population that you're screening so we might do a cost effectiveness study and uh and tom gift has done some of these in our in our division where he'll show the cost effectiveness for different uh chlamydia prevalence rates so you can tell like if well if you're a low chlamydia prevalence area it might not be nearly as cost effective as if you're you know, if you have high chlamydia prevalence uh, to do this screening. So again, like you're saying, by providing that information and the cost effect in the study, people can get more personalized results for their their situation. Yeah, and, and it's being able in the, um, yeah, being able to sift through that in the, I must say, it was thinking of like very basic terms like journal club to come back and say, uh, if I'm reading with our residents as to what, you know, how is this more broadly applicable? That was the section we're probably focusing on. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Chesson. Do you have any closing thoughts about the good, the bad, and the ugly of, um, of economics and CDC and all those things? I, I, at the end of, um, let's see, September 7th, we'll have another discussion about modeling and uh, a little bit more about advanced analytics and natural language processing. I put in a link to a recent article on nature about that, but any closing thoughts? 
I uh, just want to uh, say thanks again for the invitation. I've enjoyed this greatly. And um, I just hope that it, at least it, it succeeded in not being boring since I put that in the title. So hopefully uh, no one was was too terribly bored. And I hope people got a good uh, flavoring of cost effectiveness studies at CDC. I think it was great. I, I think it's wonderful exactly what you needed. And uh, just seeing the, the number of people we had and the questions we had was so really just heartwarming. So thank you so much. Take and care. Thanks for everyone who joined in to see the, the the presentation today. I certainly appreciate that. All right. Well, take care, everyone. Have a good month, and let's talk to you next month on September 7th. Thanks.